Hello and welcome to Indian Standard Time. I'm Siddharth Bhardarajan. Mexico is one of the most important economies in the world, a member of the G20, um, leading energy producer, but a country that has not seen a visit by an Indian Prime Minister since 1986. Rajiv Gandhi was the last time that an Indian Prime Minister visited there, and that was 30 years ago. This year, in fact, this month, uh, June 8th, Prime Minister Narendra Modi will undertake a one-day working visit to Mexico at the invitation of the Mexican president. And joining me to discuss India-Mexico relations, the significance of the Modi visit, and where the bilateral relationship could go from here is Ambassador Melba Priya, Ambassador of Mexico to India. Welcome to the show, Melba. Thank you, Sid. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you all for seeing us from your home. You know, you've had, a, you've had a great year as an ambassador. I met you when you came here from Indonesia last year. And in this year, you've had your foreign minister visit. She uh, met with, of course, Madam Sushma Suraj yeah. and the prime minister. Now you have this visit by the prime minister, uh, as I said, first time in 30 years. Uh, I believe uh, Prime Minister Modi met with uh, uh, President yes. uh, Peña Nieto in, in New York. Um, many of your colleagues in the diplomatic community in Delhi must be quite jealous of you. I hope not. It's just hard work. <laughs> <laughs> and two leaders that find each other interesting and two nations that have had 60 years of very good relations and it's blooming. Right. You know, when, when we talk of India-Mexico relations, everybody goes back to Octavio Paz. And, you know, th there, is a, there is a sense of uh, a, cultural, a deep cultural connect, even though uh, we don't share language. We don't share uh, a, the, the kind of colonial history in the sense that India has an affinity with the uh, countries that were colonized by the, you know, by the British. But despite that, uh, there was a lot of hope uh, in the 40s, 50s, 60s that the India-Mexico relationship would blossom, bloom. Uh, it's done okay, but somehow high-level exchanges, high-level contact, particularly in the last three or four decades, uh, has been a little disappointing, wouldn't you agree? I do. I do agree. But uh, the relations are not only about that. The relations are about government relations, are about people-to-people -people relation, are about business relation. Mexico is the biggest investor um, of Latin America in India. We have 13 companies here. Uh, you are the biggest investor or Mexico is the biggest investor for India in Latin America. So the, so, the biggest, so the biggest destination f yes. of Indian FDI in Latin America is Mexico. Okay. And, the, and the biggest FDI of Latin America is Mexico. We have a, a trade that is not bad. It's around about $6 billion? $6, six billion. Dollars. You know, we're scratching for, yeah. with the size of the economy of India, with the size of the economy of Mexico, with the opportunities of each other. So what you have to do is to give visibility to this relationship. Uh, if we talk about trade. But if we talk about other things, as you say, culture, you know, Mexican children in fifth grade are reading Tagore. In our official textbooks, we read Tagore. How much of your children know about Mexican Chile and other things? Mexicans are called Indians because the Spaniards, many, many, many centuries ago, thought that they had arrived to the Indies. So Mexicans are called Indians because they thought that they had reached India. Look at me, look at yourself. And people say, oh yeah, we arrived in India. So that's why Mexicans are called Indians. Every chili that is consumed in, in, uh, in India came from Mexico. Then you made it better because your soil has different uh, qualities and that's it. You have curry, we have mole. It's exactly the same thing. Uh, so we have many similarities, but science and technology, uh, aerospatial, there are many other areas in our relationship that are blooming, but they are not well known. Right. So what we're out there to do is let people know what Mexico-India relations are really about. You know, a few years ago, uh, th there's, a, there's a kind of historical connect. A few years ago, I helped um, edit a book written by uh, an Indian author called Savitri Khankoje, whose father, Pandurang Khankoje, was uh, an Indian freedom fighter who actually spent about 20 years of his life in Mexico. Yes. And he was a collaborator with Diego Rivera. He was an agronomist and he was recognized by your government and of course came back to India after independence. So, so there are M. N. Roy, another prominent Indian politician had connections with the uh, Very important. Mexican Roy. radicals. Exactly. Uh, so, so there is a sense in which I think there's been connections beyond government, beyond, beyond the private sector, an emotional, political, social connect. And uh, I think 
uh, it would be wonderful if now, given the high-level political interaction, uh, the entire relationship gets a, gets a kind of boost. How? T tell us something about how the current visit of Prime Minister Modi has has uh, has come about. Is it was this something uh, arranged quite suddenly, or has it been in the works for for the past year? I would say it's a, both things are true. Uh, first of all, we are expecting an official visit of Prime Minister Modi in the first quarter of 2017. It has some something that has a, was agreed in the UN General Assembly. That's why my minister came. That's why Madame Shuraj is going in to Mexico in September, October to have our joint commission. So this has been in the making. Then, of course, Prime Minister Modi's visit to the US uh, started. And you know, I started saying sort of, you're already going to be in the US. Uh, it's very, very close. Uh, well, we don't have time, yes, no, yes, no. And then suddenly they say, yes, we take up your invitation. Yes, we want to come. So, so this is the, what was planned for 2017 is now going to happen. No. Uh, oh, so that will still go on? We okay. hope, we hope that it will still Wonderful. go on. Yeah. This is a short uh, working visit. This is to pave the way for our joint commission. This is to pave the way for 2017 when the leaders will have really like long um, interactions with each other. And uh, so, you know, we're very happy that Prime Minister is coming for a working visit. Uh, we'll have a nice dinner with the president and we're going to work. It is a working visit. Right, right. So without the ceremonial trappings that would come with the, yeah, but that's fair enough. Uh, the last time a Mexican president came to India was in 2007. Yes, uh, President Calderon. President Calderon. Uh, how would you evaluate uh, the implementation of decisions and agreements that were struck at that time? It's been, what, nine years? Uh, would you say that uh, the momentum that that visit sought to impart on the relationship has been fulfilled to some extent? Yes. Uh, of Trade course, was a big focus. Cha changes yeah, yeah. of government do make a difference. Um, you know, we had change of government in, in both sides. But it's incredible what is happening really in our relationship. From here to September, we will have three different high-level groups meetings. So we have the trade and investment uh, meeting in Mexico in June. We have in July the science and technology. We have another uh, coming up for solar energy and aeronautical and all of these in September. So many things are happening that are maybe not out there. And those are the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. They meet every two years. One time they meet in India, one time they meet, they meet in... And, and this is an agenda that came out of the 07 visit? Yes. Okay. So, so it has been happening, right. even if we don't necessarily know it. Right. So, you know, sometimes things are slower, sometimes things are more prompt, but we're very excited about the relationship. It is it is 66 year old relationship. We've been through our ups and downs. There has never been a real problem between Mexico and India. We have cooperated in many issues. Um, the the green revolution of this part of the world was done with Mexican seeds. Yeah. Uh, today we have 60, 70, 100 cooperants coming back and forth for science and technology. We have 40 or more science and technology projects going on in nanotechnology, in water, in different fields of, of energy, and nobody knows it. So I don't know why we keep so silent uh, when both uh, Indians and Mexicans are not known to be, to be silent less, people. You need to be less scared of the media. <laughs> Uh, I am not actually. <laughs> let's 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 look at the um, economic dimension uh, before I come to some of the kind of political or strategic security issues. Um, trade, six billion dollars. Now the main composition of this is energy, and yes. uh, so these are uh, Mexican oil exports to India essentially. Mexico uh, exports four percent of what you consume in oil. Uh, we want to better it, we want it to be higher, maybe much higher, but we don't only want that. I always say, don't talk about six billion, talk about three billion. And three billion is ridiculous in a trade that can be much, much bigger than that. We have to make uh, business- so you're, so you're saying half of that six billion is oil? Yes. Right, okay. So we talk so, about- So what's the other three billion? Is it uh, autumn, I mean, is it sort of- Engineering stuff? Or? Engineering stuff, yeah. automobile. Um, India is producing some of the cars that are consumed in Mexico by Volkswagen. Uh, the same the other way around because that's how uh, globalized companies work. But there is a lot of many little nitties and gritties 
there is engineering, there is IT, there is a lot of consumer goods that are happening. And there are many other possibilities of things to be happening. Processed food. I mean, both our countries are very big consumers of processed food. So this is a, a possibility. Which is, not good, which is not good for people, by the way. Minerals. <laughs> minerals. Yeah. I mean, we are the fourth largest producer of gold in the world, the first largest producer of silver in the world. And instead and you, of... And you know how Indians are crazy for gold. Yes. Right? Yeah, so silver. instead of trading bilaterally, yeah. we all go through the bursts because that's what people do. Right. So the possibilities in minerals and in other things are as big as we want to see it. Right. What we have to do is to turn our heads and look at each other in different ways. Right. Um, NAFTA, uh, d does that provide a platform for Indian investors to access, say, the U.S. or Canadian market if they, set, if they manufacture in, uh, in Mexico? Let me and tell do, we, you, do we see some evidence of that, of that happening? Let me tell you a story that one of your big uh, pharma companies told me. The CEO of that company told me, I am very happy to be in Mexico. I saw my investment in Mexico as an investment that had to do with the regional market. Uh, in pharma specifically, Mexico is very tough in its, um, in its laws for, for, for pharma. Why? Because Mexico, most of uh, the pharma is bought by the government because we have general health care. Therefore, 80%, 90% is bought by the government and given free to the people because we have uh, universal health care. So the regulations are very tough. Once you have the Mexican regulation, you go to any Latin American country because it is recognized everywhere in Latin America. But it's also recognized in Europe. So 80% of uh, FTA, for example, is recognized by the health authorities uh, of the US. So once you have the Mexican certification, it's easy or easier right. to get the American certification. So it's a global market. But what that gentleman said to me is, I am selling from my Mexico business, from my Mexican business with Mexican certification to Europe, what I cannot sell from India. Because the Mexican certification has a rank right. in, in pharma. Right. So of course, it's not, it's not free. So even though it's the same formulation, but essentially, uh, taking advantage of the Mexican... Yes, and of the Mexican FTAs. Yeah. I mean, Mexico has free trade uh, agreements or free trade arrangements right. with more than 41 countries. Right. So an Indian company that becomes a Mexican company when it comes to Mexico has all of that at their disposal. So that has been very interesting. IT, for example, the, the Indian companies are on the same... in Mexico are on the same time zone to take care of their customers yeah. in the Americas. Yeah. So for them, it has been very valuable to be in a time zone that provides how, that how possibility. How might change if, you know, if Mexico, I mean, as you, you are one of the founders, founding participating countries in the Trans-Pacific uh, yes. Partnership, uh, there are apprehensions that the TPP and arrangements of that kind, in a way, are fragmenting uh, the multilateral trading system. The WTO Doha process is stuck, and the US is pushing different initiatives. W is there a danger that the TPP might undo some of the things that India and Mexico have been doing? Because we are not going to be part of it, at least in the first decade, if, if ever. In a way, we don't have any free trade agreements with India. You know, we have a lot of dealings, and we work on, on better ways to make our business people be more successful. Because making business people successful means that you will have more jobs and we will have more jobs. So that is something that we believe in and that's why we have been doing a lot of free trade agreements and free trade arrangements with everybody. Of course NAFTA was a, you know, a big breakthrough for Mexico and a big breakthrough for free trade agreements in general. It is still discussed in universities. It is st still discussed in the diplomatic academies of every country. How did that happen and wh what did the affections? Because the, the size of the economies were very different. Well, Mexico is a much better economy today than it was when we signed the free trade agreement. In 1990s, we were um, already a skilled economy of 30% of our GDP coming from infra from doing manufacturers. Today, 60% of, 
of our GDP comes from manufacturers. A half of every manufacture done in Latin America comes from Mexico. And I'm not talking about you know, sewing together this and that. No, I'm talking about mid and high level uh, technology manufacturing. So we are the biggest producers of uh, auto parts in, in Latin America, the fourth in the world, the best, the, the number one in free, in flat screens, number one in every refrigerator in the world. That. Yeah. And, you, and you also have Mexican investments in the United States, right? I mean, when, your, when your foreign minister was here, she was saying how, I think she gave a figure of six million jobs that in, in, in the US that could be linked to Mexican entrepreneurs. Uh, that's something you don't hear from Donald Trump. <laughs> Mexico-America relations are much more complicated and very interlinked. We have a very broad agenda in any topic that you can imagine. I think the success of our relationship has been that we, after many years, have managed to not contaminate the relationship because of its problems. When you have such a big uh, border and s such a big trade, you try to, if we have a problem here, not contaminate the other hundred things that are happening every day that are okay. We are, um, you know, very conscious of the process, democratic process that is going on in the U.S. We cannot intervene and will not intervene and we should not intervene. But it was it unusual is. for your president, former presidents, I think Mr. Fox, Calderon, even Mr. Peña Nieto to have made uh, statements on uh, critical comments about Trump's some of his suggestions. What you cannot, what you cannot do is to pretend that he's not insulting your people. Right. We and don't make. A large Mexican we don't, we don't make. Uh, we don't make comments on the person, but we make comments on the insult to our people. Right. Um, you know, the U.S. is a very open economy, and it's also an open country which has many diasporas of many types. But it has a very large Mexican and Mexican origin population. So if uh, you remember maybe a few years ago, there was a film that said, A Day Without a Mexican. It was a very interesting film. And it was you know, a sort of parody. And it said, if the Mexicans would leave the US, it would be a chaos. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because you have Mexicans in every realm of life of, of, of the US. Mexican origin is as big as the nation itself. So it's the biggest minority in the U.S. And I heard an astonishing figure of the number of consulates that Mexico has in yes. the U.S. How, uh, what is it? Is it 20 or 30? No, no, no. We have 51 consulates in the, in, uh, in the whole of North America, including the five or six. That must be the most consulates any country has in exactly. any other country. It's the biggest yeah. consular uh, presence, presence of any country in any given country. Yeah. We work every day with the social security. We work every day with the schools. We work every day with agriculture. We work every day with every, everybody. Right. So right. the government to government relations, even the local to local yeah. relations are very big. You can transfer your kids from one school system to the other almost seamless. You can, you know, we have American people that live in Mexico by the millions they retire in Mexico, the, the social security and the pension system talk to each other. So, you know, we are very interlinked. You, you know, another area in which Mexico gets a bad rap from the U.S. is on this whole issue of the war on drugs. Uh, Mexico in many ways has been a frontline state. Uh, your leaders have over the years made the point that the war on drugs, has, there's a supply and a demand dimension. The U.S. has to do more to tackle its domestic demand, which is driving a lot of this trade. Uh, but there is also a debate on the need to decriminalize um, milder drugs, marijuana, for example. There was recently a UN special session of the General Assembly, which many countries had hoped would move the debate forward, but it never happened. Uh, how, how important is this as a factor in, in Mexico's relations with the US and Mexican foreign policy in general? Let me talk like two dimensions. First, the UN um, General Assembly on Drugs. It's not a coincidence that it was Mexico, Guatemala, and Colombia, or what, however you want to phrase it, that actually pushed forward for that conference. Those three countries, like many others in the world maybe, but those three countries have been suffering the consequences of uh, drug and drug war. It's not also a coincidence that we are countries that go from south to north, where the consumers are. 
the biggest consumer of drugs in the world is the United States of America. Uh, that is a fact. It's not something that I say, it's a fact. So there is a problem in those countries that are in that corridor. Many things happened uh, and many things changed the composition of that, of that war. For many years, you had something that was called the sea door. The sea door makes it easier for drug dealers to go through the sea and into the US. That was that change when President Bush decided to close the sea door of Florida. Funnily enough, it was his brother that was the, the, the governor there. So why is the sea door better? There is never a better uh, than a land door. Because you don't see people. You only see sea. You have islands, you have these, you have that. But you don't have to do that corridor. But when the corridor became the land corridor, and it had to cross from South America to North America, through Central America and through Mexico, then it really became a problem. We don't have, you are not allowed to carry guns in Mexico. And suddenly, the border of the US, for the first time in many years of neighborhood, opened its door to illegal uh, arms, arms coming from the US. But in the supermarkets, in the armed supermarkets, in the armories uh, that you have in the US. Yeah. So you have a very different reality. You have a consumer market and you have an arm market that is quote unquote unrelated but makes a difference right. for those countries that are on the way. So the whole discussion is how do you how do, you do this prohibition uh, policy, uh, a policy that becomes more a public uh, health problem? How do you make it happen in a way that it will prevent your country from being the ward laws uh, playing ground and make the people a safer place to live. Yeah. So there is a problem. For many years, that was a problem in our relation with the US. Again, as we learned, what we tried is to divide the problems that we have with the US and work on the things that are very good in our relationship with the US. So you know, we have to talk about it, but we have to talk jointly about it. It's not a US-Mexico problem. It's a global problem that has to be uh, tackled and looked at in a global, in a global environment. Uh, we're almost out of time, but I have to ask you a final question. One of the global issues uh, that in a way divides Mexico and India, and I'm sure this will come up in some shape or form when Prime Minister Modi is in Mexico City, is of course UN reform, where the Indian position is for expansion and the permanent membership. G4 is the group that we are part of. Mexico is a proud member of Uniting for Consensus, yes, yes. the, the so-called coffee club, which says that there should not be any addition in uh, permanent membership. Uh, how wedded is Mexico to that position? Uh, is there any scope for uh, India and Mexico to work uh, to bridge this gap? It would be the same if I asked you how much wedded are you to your wife? Uh, we are wedded with that position, as much as India is wedded with its position. We are not against uh, the position of India on the, you know, we just think that the um, architecture of the UN, and especially the, the whole idea of, of that is that we should have a more transparent governance in the, in the UN, and that can only be if you have more members of the Security Council, but more members that are non-permanent, that you don't have a veto. I mean, there are things that you cannot go back with, okay. but so like that. But let me just, before we finish, go back to the visit to Prime Minister Modi. We are very um, happy, if that's the right word. We are very uh, engaged with that visit with Prime Minister Modi. We will talk investment. We will talk, uh, as I say, science and technology. We will talk aerospatial. We want to be part of the aerospatial project of India. Uh, we are very interested in uh, launching some of our satellites with Indian technology. Uh, we will also talk about, of course, UN and, and general matters because that's what leaders do. They are part of G20, they are part of the UN, and there are many things that are important to us. And so the relationship is a 66-year-old relationship that is blooming. Uh, we want more people to come to Mexico. We had uh, 55,000 Indians coming to Mexico, uh, most of them because they have US visa. 
only 10,000 uh, visas were given, but we had 55 uh, visitors. We are now extending the possibility of having a one-year Schengen visa, so you don't need a Mexican visa. Okay. We love Indians. Right. On that note, Ambassador Melba Priya, thank you so much for joining us on Rajya Sabha TV. And thank you. Thank you. Well, that wraps up this episode of Indian Standard Time. Do join me again next week with another guest. Thank you for watching.